okay? Right, away we go. I'm Andy Treacher, Alison's brother. I'm Tim Treacher, uh, Alison's elder brother, and I was the person who identified her uh, at the inquest. On the night of the accident, can you tell us where you were? Yes, I would have been in uh, the centre of Leicester. Um, I was living in a flat in an old Victorian block. And I can remember the, the rent, it was £2.50 a week and there were four of us contributing to that uh, rent. I was married uh, and living in uh, a new housing estate on the edge of uh, Reading. The night was a Sunday and I don't really have any good memories of that time and if you ask me more questions about you know who told me and my reaction it is I'm afraid a bit of a bit of a blur. I didn't have anything on the night of the accident I don't know what time we went to bed, maybe reasonably early. It was a Sunday night. Somewhere around six, my aunt, Chris, from, phoned from London and said, in, I don't think she was very distressed, but, you know, unhappy. Um, she said, I've, I've been awake all night. Um, Alison hasn't come back. Uh, and that was the first I knew about it. Black Sunday at Hither Green, South London. At least 53 people died when a London-bound train from Hastings jumped the rails, overturning 10 coaches. The crash occurred less than two miles from the spot where the Lewisham rail disaster took place 10 years ago, in which 90 people died. I, I have a strong sense that she went with a friend and that gave her some backing to do that because, you know, in those days, youngsters didn't travel around quite so much and to go and I think she went to Florence and, and to stay there by herself. I think she would have been with a friend. She certainly had a boyfriend in um, uh, Florence. He was really charming, but he was a member of the Communist Party and this rang alarm bells for my parents who were very, um, very uneasy about that. She'd lived with him, uh, I suspect, got pregnant, and I think had an abortion. Well, I'm, I'm pretty certain. Um, never discussed in the family, but she had an illness and needed some money for a doctor's bills. <laughs> We went down into Kings Road and we uh, just picked up a taxi, uh, told the taxi driver where he got where to go to, and he said, Oh, I think I know where it is. And I distinctly remember when we got there, he got us straight there, uh, and he said, Well, look, I got it right. And I remember my aunt getting out of the taxi saying, At least somebody's happy this morning. You know, it was, she was, you know, she was quite a humorous and, you know, humane person. And so as we were going in, we met, uh, I don't know how he recognised him, maybe, I don't think my aunt had met him, but the father of the two girls that um, Alison had been to Eastbourne to stay the weekend with. And he actually gave us, he said, I think it's number whatever. Uh, because he just identified his two daughters who were killed coming back to London. I met the train driver 
in the lavatory and we'd said before in the family you know it must be awful for that guy and even if he was at fault it must be absolutely dreadful and by that stage it emerged that he clearly wasn't at fault so I was able to just speak to him and say you know how we felt for him and we had to contact an undertaker and my father started calling the undertaker but broke down and I had to take over. That evening <coughs> I had to get on the train and go to Leeds and that was extremely difficult. I really was very, very nervous and I'm not a nervous person and, <coughs> and I got on and I hadn't had any or barely any food all day and I don't function out well without food and um, so I went to the restaurant car on the Leeds train um, I think as soon as I got on it practically and uh, I was nervous and ordering and so on and a man came and sat opposite me and talked the whole way to Leeds he was from a bank I don't know which one and he'd been down to sort out some problem he'd got with the bank he was a, a bank manager of some sort and he wanted to talk about that and it was actually the best thing in the world because I didn't have to say a thing all the way through. I can remember the this, this small kind of funeral reception in my parents house but then I'm overcome with embarrassment because the one thing that I can remember about that was that uh, for some bizarre reason, we didn't talk about Alison very much, but we got into kind of political conversations about what was happening to de Gaulle in France, because this time was a kind of prelude to the massive events the following year in 1968. And I, I'm incredibly embarrassed that my main memories were about that conversation and not about the tragedy and so on. I think I was just numb and in a different place. And part of me was quite grateful that that I responded in that way because I think it could have been devastating because to lose a sister is to lose a sister. And to be a little bit detached and able to cope in that way, um, well, Got, obviously got mixed feelings about it, but that's the way I did it. And uh, I must say that in many ways, it's later on uh, when I was more middle-aged that her loss really came home. He came over one Christmas, he came one Christmas now. And the thing I really remember was I, um, the, the bird we had, a, presumably a small turkey, he absolutely cleaned every scrap of meat off the bones. You know, you could see the poor background because he came from a very poor thing. He obviously was intelligent. He learned pretty good English, and I think he spoke French as well. As you know, they the, these market. That's that's the only qualification you had to work in the market was to be able to do more than one language. Um, and uh, there was pressure particularly by my aunt, as I remember, but probably from my mother, to, you know, tell Alistair this wasn't possible. And I said, no, it's not my business, it's her life, she must make her own decision. I'm, I'm not going to interfere in other people's life, you know. I mean, I suppose if I'd been very close to her, I might have been able to talk to her, but I wasn't that close where it would have been, I think, anything other than, um, you know, an intrusion. <laughs> so, yeah. How do you think Alison's death affected your mum and dad? Particularly my mother, absolutely, I would say horrifically, I would use that word, I don't think she really recovered. I mean, um, she died a few years later and I think she was still in mourning when she died. My father, very much later on when my first marriage had broken up and I 
counsellor asked me to talk to my father about our childhood. I couldn't get anything out of him really at all, except to say that he thought it was awful the way I and Andy had treated Alison. I was incredibly shy as a teenager and girls were kind of these strange creatures that we never saw because I was in a, in a, in a all boys school and um, she actually had a friend that traveled with her by train uh, every day and this friend took a fancy to me and of course I didn't know this at all but she arranged um, for us to play tennis together because I was a very good tennis player and, that, and she and I can't remember her name this is Elizabeth was my first girlfriend so my sister actually did me a, a really, really great favour because, you know, I was uh, really struggling. Shout out to Elizabeth <laughs> watching. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Dad. Brilliant. <laughs> it's funny how the memories come back, isn't yeah. it? Aww. Aww. Oh. That's sweet. It is. It Aww. is very sweet, yeah. I mean, it didn't last, but I was no, very gauche. And of course, it was disrupted by going away to university. Yeah. Otherwise, my life might have been something quite different. Oh, I'd be probably I'm living in st stink, stinking, stunning. <laughs> stinky, stunning. Stinky, stunning, yeah. <laughs>